Dear colleagues, uh, it is my great pleasure to open the second day of the conference at the University of Arts in Belgrade, uh, Cultural Diplomacy and Cultural Relations, Strengthening Fair Cooperation, Diversity and Dialogue. So uh, today we have the second keynote lecture uh, that will be provided by Dr. Natalia Grincheva from La Salle College of the Arts, University of Melbourne, entitled the, the Past, the Present and Future of Cultural Diplomacy as an Academic Discipline. The respondent of today's uh, keynote lecture is Professor Dr. Daya Tusu from Baptist University of Hong Kong. And now, before I give the floor uh, to our keynote uh, speaker today, I will shortly introduce uh, both uh, um, participants and their biographies. Dr. Natalia Grincheva is a program leader on arts management at La Salle College of the Arts and senior research fellow in the digital studio at the University of Melbourne. She is an internationally recognized expert in innovative forms of global trends in contemporary museology, digital diplomacy, and international cultural relations. Her publication profile includes over 40 research articles, book chapters, and reports published in the prominent academic outlets. Her most recent publications are the two monographs, Museum Diplomacy in the Digital Age, uh, published by Rutledge, and The Global Trends in Museum Diplomacy, also by Rutledge. Dr. Grincheva's professional engagements include her dedicated work for the International Fund for Cultural Diversity at the UNESCO and the International Federation of Coalitions of Cultural Diversity, and also her research industry placement at Creative Hub at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, as well as service in the International Cultural Research Network. Dr. Daya Tusu is Professor of International Communication, Department of Journalism, School of Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University. He was visiting professor at Disney Chair in Global Media at Schwarzman College, University of Beijing. For many years, he was Professor of International Communication and Co-Director of India Media Center, as well as Research Advisor to the China Media Center at the University of Westminster in London. With a PhD in International Relations from uh, Yavahal University in New Delhi, he worked as a journalist both in India and the UK for the Press Trust of India, the country's national news agency, and at the Jiminy's news service at the, as associate uh, editor. Um, Professor Tusu is the founder and managing editor of the SAGE journal, Global Media and Communication, also author and editor of almost 20 books, among them Communicating India's Soft Power, Buddha to Bollywood. I'm really um, uh, honored to uh, be moderating this session today. My name is Liliana rogash Miatovic, of course, from the University of Arts in Belgrade, and uh, now I would um, ask Dr. Natalia Grincheva to offer her lecture. Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. I am very delighted and honored to give this keynote for this really exciting conference on cultural diplomacy and cultural relations, which actually brings together so many distinguished keynote speakers and respondents and academics and professionals. It's really amazing. And I believe opening a new graduate program in cultural diplomacy is absolutely needed and relevant initiative, especially in the times when the humanity is at the age of new significant geopolitical shifts, political and economic crises, and new nationalist and populist movements that are happening not only in the real world, but also increasingly in digital environments that have a tremendous impact on our lives. So thank you, Professor Liliana uh, and uh, Professor Milena 
for inviting me to the universities to, to participate in this conference that actually opens the whole new master program in cultural diplomacy. So it's my pleasure to share my research with you today. In my presentation, I would like to share several most recent research projects on cultural diplomacy and soft power. And I will start by sharing my analysis of cultural diplomacy scholarship uh, produced since uh, its inception, the whole inception of the practice, and then move to further to identify and describe three foundational trajectories, which I believe are important research avenues for the future of cultural diplomacy. So they include uh, post-national diplomacy, post-human diplomacy, and post-colonial diplomacy. So let's start from the definition. Cultural diplomacy as a practice and as a subfield of national foreign policy emerged in the midst of the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Russia. And initially it was defined by the United States Department of State in 1952-59. And you can see the definition on the screen. Uh, cultural diplomacy is based on of course, international exchanges of different types that are usually administered through state departments of foreign affairs or ministries of culture. And if not mitigating geopolitical conflicts, the ultimate goals of cultural diplomacy include creating a positive view of the nation in the eyes of the foreign publics, facilitating a stronger cooperation or creating a political alliances. Uh, while according to Arndt, cultural diplomacy can only be said to take place when formal diplomats serving national governments try to shape and channel this flow uh, of culture to advance national interests, various cultural diplomacy programs and exchanges have always empowered people from different uh, countries to meet for a productive and enriching collaboration and mutual learning. And these people-to-people -people relationships, in fact, were instrumental to build foundations of trust and understanding and plant the seeds of positive human perceptions. And many countries have been engaged in exchanges of cultural diplomacy for several centuries, I would say, uh, even though they didn't call it cultural diplomacy. And the importance of supporting international art programs on the national levels has, of course, been uh, recognized, especially in the last decades. However, cultural diplomacy as a field of research and academic inquiry has gained force only in the past 20 years. In my most uh, recent research, I challenged myself to explore the whole body of academic scholarship produced uh, from 1959 the year when the first article on cultural diplomacy was published. And I wanted to reveal what specific issues and questions cultural diplomacy scholars covered already in the academic research in the past to identify and discuss the most critical research trajectories for the development of this discipline in the future. To address this task, I explored the Scopus database, the largest curated bibliographic abstract and citation database in the world, as evidenced in the figures presented on the slide. And the body of relevant data of cultural diplomacy scholarship was collected uh, via Scopus API data aggregation in February, actually, this year. It's most recent. So uh, I mined the repository textual data using just one key uh, term which was cultural diplomacy. And I collected information on all publications only in English language, uh, which contained this uh, research term either in the abstract or in the publications keywords. So my research resulted in 1,663 items and employing mapping, chronology building, and focused content analysis of uh, uh, relevant publications data, as well as thematic analysis of selected articles, I developed, uh, which I believe is a comprehensive account of cultural diplomacy scholarship, which can identify thematic and uh, geographic coverage gaps to propose the future development of this uh, research discipline. So putting all existing scholarship on the timeline, I revealed that only a small proportion of all existing scholarship on cultural diplomacy was produced before 2010. And actually 2010, it was the time when my first article on cultural diplomacy was published. <laughs> so it's very, very, you know, significant for, for me. So more importantly, only re recently, the academic field of cultural diplomacy has become the most fruitful with around 200 pieces published 
uh, every year in the past several years. So the thematic analysis of abstracts also indicated that almost half of the research right now is based on the historical analysis of cases, not the current diplomacies, but current diplom the diplomacies that were uh, long ago, and sometimes even dating back to six or seven centuries. Furthermore, I mapped uh, uh, geo data pertaining to cultural diplomacy scholars' university affiliations to identify areas on the global map where cultural diplomacy literature is mostly produced. So the result of this mapping demonstrates a high density of publications on cultural diplomacy originating in such countries as, guess, of course, United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, with lesser but still significant outputs coming from Russia, Canada, and China, as well as from few European countries. Uh, if we look at Central and Eastern Europe, for example, we can see that there are only a few academic publications of cultural diplomacy that are listed in the Scopus database. Only two I could find from Serbia, and the situation is even uh, worse when we, when we go to some uh, countries from Africa, East Asia, or Latin America, of course, with zero publications so far in the Scopus. Uh, these results are not surprising, though, as they attest to process of unfolding academic colonialism, neocolonialism. And indeed, it's great to see that cultural diplomacy as an academic discipline is gaining force and, and all those gap areas through new graduate programs uh, like, uh, you know, you're trying to develop. And I think it will boost the scholarship development and uh, it will raise the new generation of cultural diplomacy scholars. And I'm very, very happy to support this initiative. Second, I wanted to understand what areas on the uh, global map attract stronger academic attention. To address this question, I met data collected uh, by parsing all these, uh, you know, articles, abstracts, to count frequencies of direct refer references to different countries. The results of my mapping demonstrate that academic scholarship more often refers to cases of cultural diplomacy in the most powerful Western countries, like the United States or UK. It also re reveals that top countries that invite academic research on cultural diplomacy include China, Japan, and Russia. Specifically, four major countries, such as United States, UK, and China and Russia, have always attracted a significant amount of attention from academics exploring cases of cultural diplomacy across decades. The geography of coverage is not surprising, at least for me, considering that cultural diplomacy as a practice was born in the time of the Cold War that put in a position to major ideological systems such as, uh, you know, capitalism spreadheaded by United States uh, and the UK and communism promoted by Soviet Russia and China. Interestingly, guess what, what was the first uh, cultural diplomacy article published? The very first article on cultural diplomacy explored Chinese communist foreign policy discussing Peking's people's diplomacy and cultural activities as a powerful tool to influence, uh, you know, different parts of the world that allowed China, China to strengthen its position in several countries. Described in many historical works, so memoirs writ written from both sides of the Iron Curtain, uh, cultural and artistic and educational exchanges uh, conducted by governments of all these four countries, Russia, United States, China, UK, uh, offered a real, uh, you know, a very rich material for conceptualizing cultural diplomacy in the past decades. These were the first calls who actually tried to define and to explain the mechanism of cultural diplomacy. Uh, in more recent scholarship that focuses on contemporary cases of cultural diplomacy, again, the complexities of the geopolitical climate of transition from unipolarity to more multipolar distribution of global power, Russia, again, with its ambivalent and conflicted place in the international society, as well as China, as a growing dominant economic power with its assertive global expansion policy, 
keep top position on the focused countries list. For example, I list here some of the books on Chinese cultural diplomacy and they're, they're, like it's a lot of research right now that is being published on Chinese cultural diplomacy. So the situation, uh, this situation signals the need to address these geographical gaps in scholarship to develop a much more diverse picture covering different parts of the world. This becomes even more critical in the conditions when the geographical coverage of the majority of countries from the global south is based on their analysis as predominantly targeted areas or subjects of cultural diplomacy activities of more powerful actors. However, there is an emerging scholarship that looks into diplomatic practices of developing countries from a more actionable position. And this literature discusses the rich culture, language, heritage, traditions of developing countries as a powerful resource to articulate and promote national identity, combat colonialism, develop regional alliances, and build pieces in conflicting areas. A good example of this is a historical inquiry of Pathler published in 2021, most recently, uh, into the legacy of the World Festival of Negro Arts developed in 1966 in Senegal. United 45 nations, the festival uh, served as a platform for cross-cultural dialogue among contrasting musical traditions and practices to recover African pre-colonial heritage, strengthen liberation from the colonial past, and to promote inter-African alliances and mutual cooperation necessary for lasting peace in the region. In more recent account of cultural diplomacy activities initiated by newly emerged economic powers with colonial legacies, there is another research conducted also and published most recently about co a comparative analysis of Qatar and Singapore. Uh, so uh, Molho, the name of the scholar, he focused on both small states' ambition cultural diplomacy strategies based on the establishment of world-class cultural and educational institutions and on their integration into regional and global uh, cultural networks. Many Western scholars still challenge uh, the status quo of these new emerging powerhouses like Abu Dhabi, Singapore, Qatar, who strategically employ the power of culture to raise their city brands and expand their global reach. For example, Melissa Nisbet in her recent article interrogated, can soft power be bought and why does it matter? While this research diversifies cultural diplomacy coverage, a lot of questions still remain unexplored. Moreover, diversifying the uh, cultural di diplomacy geography coverage should go beyond a mere putting developing countries on the research map. My analysis has identified a new trajectory of the discipline development. I argue that in the future, cultural diplomacy um, a post, as a post-national endeavor would need to acquire more academic attention and focus to research because of the various geopolitical processes that are currently happening. So the paradigm of national promotion has been especially important and strongly shaped the international cultural exchanges and communications since the time of the structuration of the modern state or the Stalin state. And reinforced in the 19th century, national promotion remained a dominant diplomatic paradigm, which defined how nation states constructed their identities in the international arena and communicated with other countries. Not surprisingly, cultural diplomacy as a practice was born with major objectives to communicate a positive country image to the outside world. And these tendencies have been extensively covered in cultural diplomacy scholarship that predominantly focused on the national dimension of foreign policies operating mostly through a bilateral paradigm. For example, the legacies of the Cold War between the United States and Soviet Russia are reflected in a large body of historical research, and I already mentioned uh, today this. From the United States perspective, this research reveals how cultural diplomacy was employed as a political tool operating very much within the model, uh, representing the transmission of American skills and values to the others. However, in the conditions of the rapidly unfolding process of globalizations that widened, deepened, accelerated global in in interconnections between countries, new cultural diplomacy paradigms steadily emerge. 
going far beyond state initiated bilateral exchanges. Globalizations gave rise to a new ideological dimension that is built on growing transnational dimension of politics in the postmodern international system. Uh, for example, sociologist and philosopher Ulrich Beck identified and stressed the power of such important mechanism of globalization as transnationalization or the intensification of transborder human informational media and financial flows, deterritorialization, the growing disconnection between place and culture, and cosmopolitanization, the changing relationship between the local and the global leading to dissolution of the absolute powers of nation states in the global environment. As reflected in emerging cultural diplomacy scholarship, there are new topics that start to raise on the research agenda, and they evolve on the intersection between cultural practices and important issues of global resonance and significance. For example, the climate change crisis as a catalyst of cultural diplomacy initiative is explored in several works already. Other issues attracting diplomacy scholars include disability activism, uh, LGBT global rights, or transnational feminist movements as a part of cultural diplomacy activities. These studies signal that despite a recent rise of populist and nationalist politics, there is still a room for a humanity-centered public diplomacy. This is what is advocated by Rhonda Zaharna, and I place her most recent book published last year in the center. This discourse acquired a new meaning during the global outbreak of COVID-19 epidemic, of course, and the future research should focus more on this cosmopolitan or transnational cultural diplomacy manifestations and their implications to peace building and collaborations. Moving from a macro level of cultural diplomacy research uh, focus, it is important to note that a few recent articles also expose another level of geographical complexity that have not yet received a quiet academic attention. Exploring cultural diplomacy as a tool of expressing cultural identities of marginalized communities, indigenous people, sub-regions, contested territories, invite for the investigation. For example, in two, uh, also in 2021, Ukrainian scholars published a piece that explores cultural people-to-people -people diplomacy of Budjak, the Ukrainian region bordering on Romania and Moldova and uniting diaspora of Albanian, Bulgarian, uh, German, Greek, Jew, <laughs> Polish, Romanian, and Russian minorities. In this case, cultural diplomacy activities uh, in preservation and promotion of local languages and cultural traditions aims to strengthen the ethnic consciousness of the region. More importantly, it helps uh, gain mutual understanding in, um, in inter-ethnic relationships to promote intercultural dialogue and tolerance as necessary prerequisite for living in the multicultural society. From a contrasting perspective, for example, Hong, the Chinese scholar, explored how minority ethnic or indigenous cultures and heritage can become a powerful tool in the hands of the state, leveraging its regional power and identity. So his research explored how Taiwan mobilized its prehistory, Austronesian linguistic and heritage and indigenous culture to reposition itself in the Asia Pacific from a part of China to being a part of a, a bigger region by establishing cross-border exchange and partnerships among indigenous communities in Taiwan and Austronesian peoples. So the article reveals the extraterritorial role of uh, indigenous heritage that can be strategically mobilized as a tool of cultural diplomacy to strengthen a small and contested state position in a wider region. Both articles, the previous one and this one, open a conversation on more nuanced cultural diplomacy that exists beyond a traditional bilateral setting in the international relation context. It exposes a high cultural diversity of countries from within, um, challenging the national status quo. 
In a highly globalized world with more diverse multicultural populations residing in different countries, internal cultural diplomacy directed towards domestic populations should become a research priority. A newly emerging but uh, scarce scholarship indicates a growing need to shift the focus of cultural diplomacy research from national to post-national dimensions. And this dimension should include a more nuanced exploration of both global perspectives of humanity-centered diplomacy, as well as the research of subnational, local, and territorial levels. Moving from geographies of cultural diplomacy to the key topics on the agenda, I would like to now focus on another important trajectory that I argue is rapidly emerging and will be foundational for our understanding of cultural diplomacy in the future. Human-to-human -human, uh, communications and cross-cultural exchanges have always been a strong component of cultural diplomacy activities, which was quite extensively covered in dedicated scholarship, as you all know. It argued that people-to-people -people dialogue is a key tool to contest existing misconceptions and stereotypes to empower participants to negotiate their cultural knowledge, perceptions, and identities. In cultural diplomacy activities, Art, for example, has played a foundational role in establishing these human bridges across borders. The scholarship on arts diplomacy is indeed very diverse, encompassing a wide variety of applications which focus on different kinds of artistic practices as the core in international cultural exchanges. And they include uh, dedicated works on museum diplomacy, heritage diplomacy, ballet, performance art diplomacy, arts festival diplomacy, and music tours from legendary jazz diplomacy during the times of the Cold War to more recent uh, rap and hip hop diplomacy. More recently though, emerging technologies opened new avenues for exploring completely different art practices, which no, do not necessarily take place in traditional physical environments and even invite interventions of non-human actors. For instance, a development of worldwide large group online environments designed for real-time interactivity among participants have significantly advanced with the emergence of new metaverse technologies. The applications of metaverse technologies and cultural diplomacy are really promising with some of the countries immediately recognizing new opportunities and jumping into <laughs> these new developments to engage audiences on the global scale. In the past three decades, for example, South Korea government investments and efforts in going global by wielding its cultural soft power have produced a phenomenal growth in global popularity of Korean culture known as Halua, Korean Wave. And most recently, the Korean Wave agenda and programming opened new channels through metaverse technologies. In the challenging times of restricted traveling in the pandemic conditions of COVID-19 global outbreak in 2021, K-pop groups established new practices of interacting with their global fans in virtual spaces through different metaverse platforms, with, which offered uh, exciting opportunities for audiences. Again, all these initiatives were strongly supported by the government. While new technologies appear and transform human practices of cultural sharing very dynamically, as you can see, Cultural diplomacy scholarship is not progressing with the same speed to cover new cases of technological developments. For example, the establishment of cultural embassies in virtual world like Second Life started more than a decade ago with the Republic of Maldives opening its first virtual embassy in Second Life. Um, it was in May 2007. However, since the time, there were only a few, maybe one or two publications that explored the value, meaning, and mechanics of Second Life cultural diplomacy activities. New scholarship should modernize the cultural diplomacy research agenda to move along with the rapid development of human cultures and artistic practices. The future research should embrace new emerging forms of digital and new media arts, cyber art, robotics art, artificial intelligence arts, to explore new artistic mediums of the future, which transform, automate, but also complicate a challenge cultural diplomacy. Furthermore, the increasing digitalization and platformization process significantly redefine the conduct of cultural communications impacting the environments where cultural diplomacy is operating. 
Digital platforms are powerful governing system that control public communications, mediate economic, political, and cultural transactions among multiple actors, and become important surveillance machines which track and record users' data. Platforms algorithms govern the news and content consumption, as well as intervene in users' interactions, actively shaping the social world of people. They are powerful enough enough to accelerate cultural and political fragmentation of society, in many cases exacerbating the difference between cultural communities uh, and also negatively impacting digital, diplo digital diplomatic initiatives. Despite the growing number of focused research works on digital diplomacy per se, digital cultural diplomacy remains largely unexplored. There are only a few works right now which investigate cultural and political implications of digital archiving technologies and analyze cultural heritage, digital platforms from the political economic perspective or as a new force of cultural uh, colonialism. Nevertheless, more research is required to situate these activities in the framework of cultural diplomacy that consistently moves into the world of digital and virtual communications, with these trends being significantly amplified by the global pandemic crisis. And by the way, we are now on Zoom talking about cultural diplomacy and opening a new cultural diplomacy program. Um, also, in online communications among cultural organizations and their global audiences, a human effort to deliver information is increasingly replaced with chatbots. Cultural and heritage institutions increasingly use chatbots to sustain live conversations online, answer frequently asked questions, guide visitors through the door, or help them to find useful information. Artificial intelligence enabled applications that digitally resurrect historical figures artists and thought leaders based on the archival material and footage enables a communication not only across space and cultures like it was before, but also across time. The Dali Museum in the United States, for instance, employed the power of artificial intelligence to design a deep fake of Salvador Dali who can interact with visitors to share his life and work. The museum used its archives of hundreds of interviews, quotes, footage, and train the algorithm to recreate Dali's personality and even imitate his facial and bodily expressions. However, the deep fakes of historical figures, no matter how accurate they are, still a subject of artificial intelligence by us. The digitally reconstruct Dali is an algorithmic aggregate of the sum total of the painter's celebrity image shaped by the cultural commercialization and commodification processes. Innovation and algorithmic historical cultural memory stewardship could, of course, offer cultural diplomacy exciting opportunities to engage people across borders in a new ways. But the question remains if machines can deliver the same depth, meaning, and quality of communications as human beings. Well, there has been excitement around deep fakes used in museums, robots giving addresses for the United Nations assembly, or works of art created by artificial intelligence. The impact of such a cross-cultural communication has not been researched yet. And it is important to interrogate further the capacity of artificial intelligence to sustain an engaging cross-cultural dialogue and to shape meaningful perceptions of another culture. This research on agenda of cultural diplomacy should engage closer with these issues, which affect the focus, forms, delivery, uh, and nature of contemporary diplomacy. In the final part of my presentation, uh, I wanted to discuss a neocolonial power of diplomacy that emerged due to increasing digitalization and datification processes. Specifically, the defecation refers to a process through which social interaction require, acquires a new digital online dimension generating quantified data, allowing for real-time tracking and predictive analysis. And this creates conditions for more rigorous assessment of the diplomatic impact, which has always <laughs> remained an Achilles heel of diplomacy while being a central concern of national governments, who of course want to justify their efforts and investments in this endeavor. In the past, the majority of cultural diplomacy actors re uh, relied heavily on 
descriptive accounts of uh, diplomatic outputs, anecdotal evidences, and sharing best practices. However, with the rise with the internet and mobile communication, the desertification process have considerably enriched the diplomatic evaluation activities, offering new methods to measure global public engagement. The use of data in policy making and diplomacy measurement transform both the decision making process as well as a communication of policies to the masses. For example, in the past decade, the concept of soft power has gained a strong international popularity among politicians and academics. Furthermore, the extent of a nation's soft power is increasingly subject to a data driven measurements with many ranking systems produced by national governments and private actors offering convincing evidence of this trend. You can see some of them on the screen. The most powerful among them in terms of the global recognition is soft power authority index. Uh, this index measures soft power of selected countries by using uh, 75 metrics across uh, six sub indices of data. And since 2010, it measured soft power uh, for as many as 30 countries on the annual basis and earned a reputation of one of the mostly wi widely consulted indices among uh, you know, practitioners. So for many countries, the portal annual report is an important indicator of their global performance and frequently national states take their drop down score as a direct call for improvement. For example, according to 2017 soft power 30 report, South Korea soft power was ranked 21st out of 30 countries, dropping its score from the previous years and raising concerns that Korean culture is losing its competitiveness. To tackle this issue, the Korean Culture and Information Service injected nearly 10 million US dollars from 2018 to 2022 to further promote Korea's brand around the world. So uh, the developer of this index, uh, Jonathan McGlory, uh, who was based in Asia until most recently, he confirmed that there is a greater awareness in the utility of soft power and place branding, especially among Asian countries. And these countries like Singapore, South Korea, Japan, understand uh, it very, very seriously. However, grades produced uh, by this global ranking system are far from neutral. Kelly's book, Scorecard Diplomacy, stresses that Scorecard dashboards reduce a complex reality to a preferred interpretation, labeling countries' image, images and shaping their perceptions. Various uh, monitoring and grading systems are powerful means of the scorecard diplomacy as they publicly expose countries' failures and put international actors in the competition for better scores. Benchmarking has become a new knowledge production process that sets a neocolonial power for example, the Soft Power Authority Index drops, uh, draws on not numerous educators of several key sub indices that you can see on the screen. All of them champion Western democracy and score in favor of countries uh, reporting US-led uh, values, supporting uh, values of the United States. They also celebrate the neoliberal logic and legitimize the economic paradigm that largely originates from the Western world perpetuating Anglo-American hegemony. However, being like America is not a precondition of possessing soft power. Western attempts to systematize uh, the collection and use of countries' performance only reinforce how the global South remains at the bottom of the data pyramid. For example, some scholars ask why such civilizational states as India or China with uh, enormous cultural uh, heritage are evaluated on the soft power resources scale far below United States that has a history of no more than 250 years. Measuring soft power of only 30 countries, this index attracts a strong criticism as an exclusionary mechanism that systematically erases many countries from soft power geography, especially small states in the Middle East or even in Europe, like Slovakia or Serbia, not to mention the majority of countries of different parts of the world. However, this scholarship doesn't go beyond a mere criticism of the failures of benchmarking systems. Addressing these gaps, my own research creation project in the past few years took a more constructive approach. 
intending to overcome fundamental problems existing in previous developing ranking systems, I embarked on a creative practice research journey that resulted in a pilot web application museums of power map. And unlike soft power management dashboards, it didn't necessarily aim to build an ideal ranking tool to assess soft power, rather it intended to establish a scholarly platform for an inductive exploration of soft power, paying particular attention to specific variables overlooked in previous research and exposing them through geovisualization. So if you allow me, I will show you very briefly a small video that uh, captures the essence of this application. At the University of Melbourne, we've created a way for the first time to visually map and measure the soft power of museums. We have collaborated with the Australian Centre for the Moon Image to globally map ACMIS resources, outputs and outcomes. The system maps the data in five layers. The first layer maps ACMI International Collection Appeal Power based on culture and language. The more intense the green, the greater the appeal power. As you can see, the collection appeals strongly in North America, Europe and the Asia Pacific. The second layer is online engagement power and it maps ACMI's online global audiences. The varied intensity of the blue indicates that the majority of these audiences are coming from developed countries in Europe and North America. The Asia Pacific appears relatively untapped. If we move down, we come to the global connectivity power layer. And here we map ACMI's in relationship with 180 organizations around the world. We can see that ACME is strongly connected with museums in the United States and many European countries. Its relationships in the Asia-Pacific are still emerging. The next layer, local engagement power, maps the international tours of ACME exhibitions. It correlates visitation data with multiple variables across different sets of data. Finally, we have the Melbourne engagement power layer that maps ACME's local audiences. Here a map of Melbourne is divided in 200 postcodes. We can see from the intensity of the green that the majority of ACME's audiences come from the central area in the city. So there you have it. ACME mapped across various dimensions of soft power, providing the museum with a key information for strategic planning and development. So I know I'm going over time, but I ask for another maybe four minutes to finish, if you allow me. So uh, first, the dynamic web application applied uh, finer grain data to represent institutional players who generate the soft power of attractiveness on the global stage. Focusing on museums as actors of soft power, the project revealed that measuring soft power of a whole country is quite misleading. Country or citywide evaluations do not consider the multifaceted and complex nature of different and very often competing actors within a specific uh, uh, national and even regional community. And the application was particularly helpful to demonstrate the important role of museums in building soft power, exposing high complex nature of the institutional engagement and networks across the globe. Second, the project em employed geovisualization as an integrated approach. It allowed to meaningfully combine different methods of soft power exploration, such as assessments of uh, soft power capacities and resources, evaluations of outputs, uh, network analysis, and measuring audience perceptions. And the dynamic web application provided an inductive platform to explore soft power as a process enabling an investor enabling the soft power from mere resources to meaningful outcomes. Finally, various soft power dashboards represent soft power as omnipresent force, equally affecting people living in different social, economic, political, cultural uh, environments. Soft power authority, for example, uh, doesn't account for countries' soft power reach and strength in different geographic areas. A country's annual calculated soft power score implies that this country has the same image and perception among people living in various regions around the world. So addressing this uh, problem, the project, my project employed geovisualization to map soft power geographical spread and reach, demonstrating how soft power of an actor changes across different countries. Understanding soft power not as a constant, but as an important variable that dynamically changes its value on the global map 
The applications shifted away the attention from a high competition in soft power performance to exposing and exploring one's own weaknesses uh, and strength in different geographic zones. This approach stresses that there is no one winner or loser of the soft power, but rather there are multiple complex factors that shape power conversion process from resources to outcomes, depending on specific local challenges and opportunities. So I hope that my presentation today was, <laughs> was useful, interesting, and provocative for further debates and discussion, and maybe also inspiring for further development of the cultural diplomacy research, uh, move it in forward towards uh, post-national geographies, post-human constellations, and post-colonial manifestations. So I'm happy to continue the conversation beyond this conference. You can see my contact information on the screen. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. And sorry for going over time a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia. It was really worth uh, spending the additional few uh, minutes to just introduce your important research to the audience of this conference. And uh, I will just uh, continue with, uh, uh, with uh, actually uh, uh, reading uh, the comment by Holly Hunter. This has been an amazing presentation. It, it indeed is. And thank you so much. Uh, now, I would just, uh, before I introduce uh, and give the word uh, to Professor Dayatusu, just uh, uh, make uh, also a short uh, 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 reflection on what uh, I was uh, so happy to think of while you were uh, uh, lecturing on these two papers from Serbia in this whole um, amount of uh, over 1,000 publications uh, in your research. Indeed, um, uh, one of the issues that we are dealing with is exactly related to uh, databases. So in Serbia at the moment, we are in the process of, let's say, digital transformation of the academic work and trying to build, our government is investing into building the e-science web portal, the national web portal, which should uh, do this kind of meta harvesting of all the existing uh, uh, databases and also uh, connected to the global uh, global um, uh, search uh, engines and databases. But uh, I would also use the opportunity to uh, tell to our audience and to both of you that um, um, a few years ago, um, on the occasion of one also international conference, um, Professor Milena Dragicevic Šešić edited one book, uh, uh, Cultural Diplomacy, Arts Festivals and Geopolitics, and it was supported by our Ministry for Culture and the uh, Desk uh, uh, Creative Europe of Serbia, so it is available uh, also online. And uh, I will finish here with the mentioning um, on soft power. We all somehow end uh, with soft power, but in the end, uh, we uh, deal with it a lot. Just a few days ago, there was this uh, huge World Minds Conference in Belgrade, and Simon Anholt was one of the uh, guest speakers. So he really spoke a lot on his uh, nation branding uh, indexes and uh, um, about basically this uh, big data paradigm when talking about this. But in the end, uh, and thank you for showing the slide, on soft power of Serbia, because in the background, it's exactly the building of our rectorates uh, um, of our University of Arts, which is uh, located in the very nice part of the city once you come to Belgrade. And uh, Anholt uh, actually ended his speech with a, a question, why should people be glad that Serbia exists? And this should be a kind of really our USP for trying to reach um, the soft power of our country. So uh, thank you, Natalia, so much. You provoked many, many topics. Uh, and uh, especially in relation to our conference, I think the uh, notion of uh, uh, towards post-colonial culture diplomacy seems very, very timely and relevant. And here I would really stop. Uh, thank you uh, again. And Professor Daya Tusu, the floor is yours for your respondent marks, please. Thank you. Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Liliana, for um, giving me this opportunity. Um, 
I'm now definitely going to visit your beautiful city because that last slide, uh, second last slide, really, of course, that Natalia mm -hmm. showed, and then you just said that that's where your, your campus is. So no question. I'm waiting for the invitation. Um, I have to say, this is one of the best presentations that I have seen um, on this topic. Uh, it's, it's very rich. Uh, it's historically grounded. It is also futuristic. Um, and the way it is presented, that you see the speaker as well as the slides, and it's so effortlessly done and so um, skillful that I'm sort of, um, you know, we could be doing a lot of these Zoom things for the last two years. This is the best thing I've seen for many, I've attended so many of these sessions. So thank you. Um, Natalia for doing this. Um, it, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, time to be talking about soft power because um, what's happening in Ukraine and we see a very interesting uh, intersection between hard military power, economic warfare, as well as a bit sophisticated, at least from the Ukrainian side, um, soft power, cultural diplomacy, um, effort. Uh, I've been, uh, last few weeks, I've been in Europe, uh, Paris, uh, last week for ICA, but before that I was in, in uh, Venice, and you see uh, everywhere there are flags of Ukraine, there is a, a, a kind of sympathy that has been created. Uh, understandably, the country is under tremendous, uh, you know, pressure, worship of destruction. Um, but I was thinking in terms of how public diplomacy works in a, in a situation where there is a actual uh, you know, military confrontation taking place. Um, and that takes me back to the idea of cultural diplomacy, of the idea of soft power. And as Natalia very uh, well articulated in her presentation, all of this has really a US root. I mean, you could, the, the definition you quoted was from the US government. Much of the literature that you quoted is uh, essentially coming from the United States with some additions, uh, maybe from UK, Australia, but essentially working in a language which dominates the discourse. Um, so if you think of soft power as, as a concept, you know, it, it emerges, uh, the timing is very interesting. It is 1991 when the first article is published and expanded into 90, I think it was, then the article was, book was published a year later. And um, uh, Professor Nye, who was at that time a Harvard professor, also had a very distinguished record for working for the government, both uh, in the um, Carter administration and Clinton administration at senior position. So it's not just an academic work, it also has very serious political and uh, you know, geo geocultural implications. And it's interesting that within a few years of the publication of the book and the article, it became an accepted phrase. Uh, if you really analyze it, it doesn't mean very much, but it became a phrase which we, and governments across the world, I started opening, um, you know, cultural diplomacy uh, kind of sections in the foreign ministry. Um, and again, it's interesting, you, you, you alluded to it in your presentation, how this whole process of nation branding and, and the, you know, a sort of mini industry developed out of it. Again, if you look at the genesis of it, it's essentially US and UK. The city where, from where I'm speaking to you is a very important part of that process, uh, you know, that, soft power index, the software that happens in this city. And it's a very corporatized view of how you define culture, how you define a nation state, how you measure those indexes. They are deeply problematic. Um, and then you had this idea of smart power. Uh, you know, Clinton, uh, Mrs. Clinton famously said that, you know, that is the future. Uh, and it was all about digitization and, and the you know, online connectivity and what it means to cultural interaction. Uh, again, it became a phrase that everybody was using. It uh, doesn't really mean very much. What does smart power mean? So it's, a, it's a typically American expression, but you could see that quoted in Russian and in Japanese and Korean and in Chinese, et cetera, et cetera. 
more recently, uh, the phrase uh, was uh, coined on ship power, uh, which was uh, which was part of a report came out by a, a, a national endowment by national endowment for democracy, and these days you can access these things as they are released. So within a few days of this report being released, it, the phrase sharp power became an accepted phrase. Uh, so you have a New York Times editorial, you have it on the pages of The Economist, The Le Monde, The Guardian, it becomes an accepted phrase. Now, this is specifically, specifically about two countries, it's Russia and China. And the suggestion is that they are, uh, the phrase was uh, perforating and penetrating the liberal order. Uh, so what I'm trying to get to by saying this, this fact, this sort of context, is that these are deeply political issues. And they are not neutral. So if you, were, if you had the potential to look at everything that's published on cultural diplomacy, say in French or in Chinese or in Korean or in Sanskrit or in Hindi or in Serbian for that matter, you will have a, perhaps a different set of answers. Um, and that's, that's the way you know, our uh, the academic system works and the hegemony of that language which continues to define um, how we perceive knowledge, how the hierarchy works, how certain phrases might mean sharp power, for instance. Uh, we, we take it for granted, it becomes an acceptable intellectual frame, frame within which we analyze the realities. Um, I liked your, this, the, the classification of uh, post-national, post, -national, post uh, what was post-human and post-colonial. That I think is a very interesting way of um, structuring your argument. Um, but I have issues with all three. So I'll very briefly talk about that. Um, so this idea that the nation state doesn't matter, you know, both the Marxist uh, orientation oriented people would say, you know, the the uh, you know, when the proletariat take over the world, the, the state would be that away. We were told that in 1916. Uh, that hasn't happened. Then the glo globalization theory is going on about how market forces and the connectivity that will generate, the interdependence that it will create will wither away the state. The states will disappear. Actually, quite the reverse has happened. Ukraine, I started with that as a prominent example. COVID-19 is an interesting example. Look at the European Union's response to COVID-19. Nobody was talking about the union. Everybody was talking about their own country. Italians, you remember what happened to Italy in the initial months of COVID. So I think one has to be careful that, in fact, one could argue there's a revivalism of nation state. And you look across the world from Turkey to India, to Russia, to the United States, to where I am now, Brexit. You, you, and you know these are major changes. So I think I, I take that a little bit of, um, you know, qualify that. Post-human, this whole debate about AI and, you know, um, uh, deep fakes, that's uh, fascinating. But if we look at who is actually conducting it, you can count those companies on one hand. Right? So again, there's a power equation. Not everybody has the capacity to manipulate this. So we've seen that in all its glory in the case of Ukraine where metaverse, which you mentioned in a different context, openly says that you can use our platform for anti-Russian hate, violating their own explicit guidelines about what can and, can and can't be done. Right? And Mr. Musk, Elon Musk, says to the Ukrainians before the war starts, I will give you satellite connectivity. Right? You can't do it without a, approval from Pentagon. It's as basic as that. Now the state matters, big corporations do matter. So again, the power question is really, really important. And final about point about the uh, post-colonial. Um, as you know, post-colonial is a complicated discourse in itself. Um, and I would have liked to see a bit more on that if you, when you write this paper, if you haven't already written, uh, there's a lot of literature as you're aware of in, in terms of post-coloniality um, and 
uh, you know, specifically talking about museums, that was a fascinating thing you showed uh, towards the end, the, the Australian case. Um, but one has to be also aware of um, how these museums were created. Where did the artifacts come from? Uh, in your own country, in Russia, I had the privilege to go to St. Petersburg more than once, but I went to the, the most famous museum there. And normally people go there to see European art. And because, because I've lived in Europe for 30 years, I've seen most of it. So I went to the top floor and there was Asian art there. Things from my own country, very beautiful things. And they were marked as acquired from Germany, 1945. So I was asking, where did the Germans got it in the first place? <laughs> and why is it the Indian government demanding, demanding these absolutely beautiful pieces back in their museums? And remember, India is a far more important, powerful country than a, a, a Mali or a Sierra Leone, whose products, you know, uh, adorn the museum in Europe. And Europe. And there's that also, the, 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 the politics of, of artifacts. And uh, um, finally, I would say, uh, is, is much more uh, kind of fruitful to think about um, the, the civilizational uh, soft power debate, uh, which is increasingly becoming relevant. I think both uh, Russia, in, you know, saying that we have a different civilization, we are, you know, and we need to emphasize that. China has been saying that for some time. India, in, under this new government, not so new government now have been going on about, you know, we have this great heritage, whether it's yoga or Ayurveda, or we need to bring that out into the uh, international discourse. And it doesn't matter what some guy in London thinks that they, these are the 30 most important country. If you ask somebody in Africa what Denmark is, they will know, but they will know what China is or what India is, because there's some idea of this very old complicated civilization. So I think uh, if we're looking ahead, of course, uh, what you described, technical side, very important, human uh, out of state interactions, diet price, et cetera, other things, very important. But I also think intellectually, the most big, uh, interesting project for people who are interested in this and in a more complex way is to think of how do you de-Americanize the whole discourse about uh, whether it's cultural diplomacy or about soft power. Um, it's interesting the word culture, Raymond Williams famously said, is the most difficult word in English language. So you have to change culture, say with Sanskrit, it's a Sanskrit word for culture. The whole discourse is different. I'm sure there are similar things in Serbian, in, in, in Russian, in Japanese. So mm -hmm. I'll stop. Thank you ever so much. And I look forward to reading the article based on your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Tusu, very much for your insightful response. And before I open the q and I would uh, uh, give also the opportunity to Natalia for her own maybe response and a few reflections on, on your thoughts. And please prepare the questions from the audience. Uh, so, Professor Dai, that was a really incredible response, and I'm so happy that you responded very critically on all the provocation that I gave in my presentation. So, uh, I, I, I must admit that uh, post-human, post-national, post-colonial is their broader research trajectories that I believe cultural diplomacy should pay attention. Of course, I do not argue that nation states lost their power. No, absolutely not. You are totally right. They're gaining even more power. There is a rise of new nationalist movements going on around the world with the Brexit, you know, and every any other, like you said, during COVID-19. But what I try to say is there is another new layer of cultural diplomacy that definitely didn't exist before, didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. And this level of cultural diplomacy goes beyond the state or, you know, like you said, maybe civilizationals or yeah, diplomacies or diplomacy of uh, humanities, humanity-centered diplomacy. This is the one thing. And another thing that I wanted to draw attention to, you know, to complexity within the nation states. Nation states, yes, it's an agency, but 
within its we, we should always uh, uh, challenge that status quo within its exists so many different uh, cultural communities you know that also practice already their own diplomacies within one nation state so i just wanted to draw attention to these macro <laughs> and micro levels beyond the nation state that exists and this what I mean by post-national, but maybe post-national is not the best terminology to use, but uh, yes. So, and uh, post-human also. Yes, you just, you know, also said it, it's, it's, it's just emerging. A few actors are practicing it, but we will see a lot of more things happening in the future. So I was just, and, and, and you know, I, in terms of decolonizing, the whole language of uh, cultural diplomacy and of power. I think this is a brilliant, brilliant concept and we should start from our own language, right? And I must admit that I am a subject myself of American cultural diplomacy because <laughs> I, I, you know, in 2007, I left Russia first time in my life to go abroad to receive education for my master's degree uh, in Washington, D.C., and I was a Fulbright scholar. And I experienced the power of this cultural diplomacy, you know, on my own, you know, uh, emotional, uh, you know, uh, uh, identity and physical levels. So, and that was the time that I actually realized that the power of diplomacy is very, very strong. Because when I actually first went there, I... I I, I didn't necessarily, I was a, also a subject of Russia, right? <laughs> so I didn't necessarily like the United States. But the first few years in the States completely changed me as a person, as a scholar, as a researcher, as like, and it, it completely changed how I look at this world. And of course, a lot of my language is already <laughs> Americanized. And it's very, very difficult, like you said, like you said, how we can decolonize, how we can de-Americanize the language of cultural diplomacy. It's, it's really difficult to do that because you have to, like in many cases, like in my case, to change yourself. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, thank you. I, I, I think, yeah, thank you. Just thank you very much for all your critical comments. Uh, thank, thank you, you, Natalia. We are staying in the USA with the, with the notions and... Um, and the question from Holly Hunter, who is active in, in the chat box. So I will just uh, read the, the question. Where does the responsibility lie as we move in such direction? How can we conceptualize the responsibility of diplomacy, actor versus individuals agency versus like uh, corporate responsibility? So if they can't control can culture, is there an imperative to direct attention to marginalized voices of one's own nation, uh, turning from the Washington DC? So, Natalia, would you like to respond to uh, Holly Hunter's question? Uh, so the question is about how can we conceptualize the responsibility of diplomacy actors versus individuals agency if the person can maybe explain more what he means but there, i i can see here that he's interested in this kind of maybe uh you know struggle between the corporate you know power of shaping our international informational environments and national government's power do i understand this question correctly uh, if yes, so I, I also want to share that I'm currently just submitted another research uh, on a new typology of cultural diplomacy actors where I in the digital realm where I divided them in two, three kind of actors. The first uh, um, type of actor is uh, their content provider, cultural content provider. The second type of cultural actor is cultural digital infrastructure builder. And within this digital infrastructure builder, we have the most powerful, you know, actors that are still, uh, you know, uh, you know, guide the development of digital infrastructures within the world. Uh, these are the governments, uh, intergovernmental, international governments, and also corporate actors. 
who you know increasingly come into this uh, international space to define their role norms regulations and things like that and finally uh, the other actor is opinion maker <laughs> you know uh, there is no distinct boundaries between the three they all can uh, you know overlap like in the case of the uh, for example the uh, korean government where they for example the most recently they invested billions of dollars to developing their own metaverse platforms to enable their uh, you know korean way to go uh, global you know and uh, uh, because they also support cu cultural content <laughs> producers <laughs> to be a part of this cultural infrastructure uh, and uh, where they also support opinion makers right all this you know idols that you know promote korean way so uh yes do i understand the question correctly <laughs> yeah uh, uh holly hunter raised hand but then okay. uh, lowered the hand uh, yes i uh, suppose for shaping one's own forms of uh, diplomacy uh since currently it's trying to strategize how to maximize soft power Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Holly Hunter, as well. Is there another question or comment uh, from uh, the audience uh, online or at the University of Arts? Anyone? Okay, if not, uh, let me uh, thank you once again uh, for the outstanding contribution to our conference and uh, I truly hope that there will be uh, an opportunity soon to uh, also meet you live at uh, uh, in Belgrade at the University of Arts. Uh, uh, you can read uh, uh, in the chat box uh, some more um, compliments from the audience. So uh, here we would uh, close this session and uh, have a 15 minutes break. Uh, after that, um, we have a slight uh, switch in the program. So uh, live stream will be on the English session. Uh, it's in, uh, session number six. And the session in Serbian will go just on Zoom. Thank you all and uh, hope to uh, see some of you at least uh, uh, in the course of this uh, event. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.